Hello, everyone. So, amid all of the ongoing discussions about professional protesters and such, I thought it might be time to share some more of my own insights. The professional left. As protests and demonstrations throughout the country in response to the election of Donald Trump continue, a great deal of discussion is circulating, particularly within more conservative media circles, about the professional left and professional protesters. What to substantial degrees, invoking names such as Soros and Flint, are apt for such conversations considerable swaths of not only the structure of the professional left, but also the mechanisms by which demonstrations are organized, as well as the means by which such can spiral out into riots, seem to go largely under-discussed. For the purposes both of transparency, as well as hedging myself against claims that I may have missed or omitted aspects of the industry, which I'm almost certain to do. I wish to make it clear that the insights provided here come from my own experience in that professional leftist industry. That now being clarified, while it can be tempting to view the evolution of events as a strongly centralized and coordinated effort to sow dissent and disruption throughout the nation, chances are that matters are a bit less cut and dry than that, namely by way of the players and institutions themselves. While as tempting as it may be for the uninitiated to simply chalk it all up to radical actions being funded and undertaken by progressive ideologue millionaires and billionaires, the reality of matters is undoubtedly more complicated than that. To begin with, one must consider the Political Action Committee, or PAC, scene. Beyond the ads, mailers, and surreptitious issue advocacy that these campaigns are known for, it is often their field operations which derive the most real action, electorally speaking. Ranging typically from door-to-door -door canvases, handing out literature and running various forms of polls, up through stage demonstrations and sometimes actually protests, the PAC world is one made up of many players from many different backgrounds and disciplines. For most PAC operations, which seem to only crop up during elections, many of these campaigns are too pronged in respect to their management. At the top end, one quite often, but not universally, finds two key bodies. The first is the PAC itself. Normally focused on a single issue or issue set, such as environmental protection or middle-class economic concerns, organizations such as Next Gen Climate or Working America are often the formal faces of campaign efforts waged by either wealthy individuals, such as Tom Steyer in the case of Next Gen, or established institutions, such as the AFL-CIO, in the case of Working America. However, quite often, especially as was the case for Next Gen in 2014, when I last stepped foot into the field as a professional, many of these campaigns rely on an industrial infrastructure of for-profit turnkey consultancies, such as Fieldworks LLC or Grassroots Solutions, for staffing and campaign management. Beyond these, however, there exist even more substantial networks of full-time professional campaigns, such as Working America, which are often, if only in part, the political activities of America's larger unions, SEIU, AFSCME, AFL-CIO, and other assorted collections of letters representing the generally larger national and international unions, all rather routinely and consistently have one form of political campaign running at any given time or another. A large part of these campaigns, funded almost entirely by union dues, and guided generally if not exclusively by the political aspirations, ambitions, and agendas of senior union officials, are often their field operations. Having been part of these very campaigns myself, I can say that very often a fledgling union organizer, hired and trained specifically for the purposes of organizing workers into bargaining units, an endeavor that even to this day, despite my own harsh criticisms of established unions, that I remain fully in support of. Anyway, the, these organizers will oftentimes find themselves thrust into the field as community and political organizers, much to the chagrin of many. It was in this very same manner that in 2010, after being brought on by SEIU as an organizer in training, with this same intent on being a workplace organizer, that I was sent to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in an effort to begin an opposition effort against then-Governor-elect Scott Walker. 
If any of this is beginning to sound familiar, just wait. It gets a little more interesting. After having had some marginal training in workplace organizing and already possessing roughly four or five years of professional, political, and community organizing experience, I was pulled from a campaign underway in Pennsylvania where we worked to bring home care nurses into the fold and was sent up to Wisconsin for something entirely different. Almost identical to the work done during a previous experience of mine with the now largely defunct community organization ACORN. Going door-to-door -door for weeks on end, our job is to hold specialized sorts of conversations, known as organizing conversations. These directed discussions, centered around guiding them, the people we were speaking to, through fra phases of building rapport, identifying issues of concern, refocusing those concerns to the central goals of the campaign, using rhetorical manipulation to create senses of outrage, the painting of visions for proposed solutions, and then mobilizing those we spoke with, all in tried and tested manners that themselves stemmed largely from the works of Alinsky and his successive intellectual heirs. Without spending too much time on the mundane day-to-day -day details or the processes by which the campaign was made successful, which is a piece I may write or produce in the future at some time, I can say that after several weeks of pounding pavement in the various neighborhoods which surrounded the A.O. Smith factory in the center of Milwaukee, we were able then to rally nearly 700 members of the impoverished and dilapidated communities we were working in and bust them one early morning to a staged protest at the inauguration of now Governor Scott Walker. Now, as can be seen from this image, the arrival of the black flag was both anticipated and somewhat dreaded. A marshal of the event myself, meaning that sporting a yellow armband along with my fellow organizers so as to identify ourselves to one another and do our best to guide and control the movements and goings-on of the demonstration, the arrival of the black flag, with its college anarchists dressed themselves like punk rock dollar store knockoff matrix action figures, signified the likelihood that things going awry had just increased substantially. As the event progressed, these very fears became reality. Lined up with arms locked, their bandanas masking their faces, and absolutely no interest or likely even awareness in the good jobs now orientation of the demonstration, the small band took up a position near one of the main entrances of the Capitol building. Once a sufficient number of protesters had arrived and chants demanding good jobs and livable wages began, the black flag took action. It began with a girl. Running up into the Capitol building, which was actually open to the public anyway as many had to use the restroom, she, in an act of what I can only presume to be some fantasy reenactment of V for Vendetta, drew from her pocket two knives which she proceeded to run down the hall with before being tackled by state police. As it stood, none outside had witnessed this, and only upon receiving eyewitness accounts after the fact had I or any of the other marshals learned about it, and as such, the only observable events that the crowd and her anarchist comrades outside were able to witness was her being carried out, kicking and screaming by a cadre of large state troopers. It was, as I recall thinking at the time, a masterful bit of political theater. As she was then loaded into the police SUV at the base of the steps, the black-clad activists locked arms in front of the vehicle, chanting in loud and synchronized voices, Let her go. Naturally, as police declined to acquiesce, the crowd nearby saw only an activist being loaded forcefully into a cruiser in handcuffs and a small contingent of protesters demanding she be released. From there, the ranks, chanting this line, only grew. As a marshal of the event, it took us the better part of twenty minutes to defuse the situation, disperse the protesters we had organized, and restore some sense of normality and civility to the event. However, this story is but a single example of how professional activists, grassroots recruits brought on by way of selling sometimes inflamed senses of righteous obligation, and then hardline ideological sycophants can come together to form a perfect storm for political strife in theater. The corruptions and short-sighted failures of the professional left, however, do not end merely with the unforeseen flare-ups of radical outside groups. 
Much as I had previously written and spoken about, the regressive left being largely useful idiots for working on behalf, at least, of the benefit of established elites, so too do many professionals within the world of industrial activism themselves seek to co-opt the efforts of many often well-intentioned grassroots activist movements in pursuit of their own ends. One such story comes by way of an SEIU attempt to infiltrate and take over the Chicago camp of the Occupy Wall Street movement, again in 2011. Relayed to me by a friend and former comrade who was himself, who has himself since left the Union in disgust, it was during this very same organizer program that as the movement that was Occupy Wall Street truly began gaining steam, SEIU, and this is the Service Employees International Union, the nation's largest union, sought to utilize their financial and material strength to attempt a series of underhanded maneuvers, all in the aims of bringing Occupy Chicago to heel. First plying them with tents and jackets and other logistical necessities for encampment protests in the Windy City, it soon began seeding their general assemblies with organizers and mobilized activists in the hopes of creating an artificial democratic majority during their votes. Their aims, as my former comrade informed me, was to turn the Chicago-based protest movement into a front, supporting the agenda of Mayor Rahm Emanuel, a close ally of Barack Obama, who was a close ally of SEIU. The irony to this effort, being an attempt to bring what at the time was an anti-corporatist and anti-corruption movement to support what many regard to be an extraordinarily corrupt politician with close ties to the very financial elites that Occupy stood against, is only really appreciable now, thanks to their own response. Thanking SEIU for their material support, their efforts were resoundingly rejected by the activists on hand, who instead took to marching against the policies of Emanuel, despite the Union's best efforts to the contrary. Though in this instance the grassroots were able to resist the partisan trickery itself, my own career was littered with instances in which smaller, locally-based organizations with true belief in progressive principles were themselves usurped and swallowed up by larger institutions, only to be then used as fodder for campaign efforts down the line. Likewise, it is not entirely uncommon for artificial astroturf efforts to be put into effect by these same institutions, all with the aims of creating the appearance of organic activism in support of their causes, in spite of their sometimes corrupt or illiberal overall aims. It is my hope that I have illuminated some greater truths to the situations we are seeing playing out presently. For it is not merely union political actions or PAC campaigns revolting against election wins and proposed policies that led to the rise of the professional protester. In almost any given election season, PACs and consulting firms, as referenced previously, can be found openly recruiting on sites ranging from democratic gain down through Craigslist, offering anywhere from minimum wage to $15 an hour simply to help put bodies in the field. Having run such operations in the past myself, I can attest to the truth that quite often those organizing said events of protests or merely knocking on doors often have little interest or knowledge in the politics in play and are simply seeking a paycheck. All this being the case, however, the dynamics of the professional field-level politics, especially in regards to reactionary response or resistance politics, must be understood, if only with the addition of the functional realities to its infrastructure. The how it works is as important as the questions of what it does. As such, without proper understanding, chalking the actions of the professional left up to the whims and whimsies of one or two ideological industrial tycoons is not only dismissive, but counterproductive. Much in the way calling all corporate conservative political action the direct result of the Koch brothers' influence, it is the absence of nuance and depth of understanding which undermines any form of ideological or political narrative, even before they're spoken aloud. Now going forward, if so interested, I will likely delve a little further into what exactly the professional activism world is like, and how we can see it playing out in our day-to-day -day observances of modern politics. 
One thing you can be sure of is that were I, for instance, still in the industry myself, right now would be a very profitable time. In fact, this may even be one of the few times I can think of in which the professional left would find more abundant work for contractors and consultants as I was in the off-season than it did during the election itself. So, as always, I thank you all for stopping by. I hope you found this informative, if not maybe in some way entertaining. If you liked the video, feel free to give it a like and hit subscribe if uh, you haven't already. Share it around if you found it interesting. Leave a comment if you have something to add or any questions that you'd like answered. As always, you can find the article itself posted to therationalists.org. That all being the case, though, thank you once more for stopping by, and I suppose I'll just say I'll see you next time.